Hello, here is Heidi from the Wisdom Factory, and we are talking the Integral African Dialogues. And today we are a group of people talking about the experience mainly they have with Africa, because as you know, I went to Africa the first time in June, but I was so excited. And I already talked with uh, René and also with Rika, who is supposed to, to come, and you can find that on thewisdomfactory.net the conversations with both of them. And today we have also Alain. And before we, we begin to talk about whatever you want to talk about, uh, I ask you to just give a big, uh, short introduction to who you are, where you are, why you are there, and what you are doing. <laughs> Please, <laughs> who's going to start? You have to start, Alain. I think so. I already did, I think. Um, my name is Alain, Alain Bols. Um, I'm born and raised in Amsterdam in the Netherlands. Um, I have a background in change management, studied business administration and organizational psychology. For about 12, 15 years, I've been working as a hardcore consultant with the largest uh, consulting company in the Netherlands. Through my company, who had a program to uh, invite inspiring people to um, inspire our top clients, I met Don, Dr. Don Beck. That was just after a long sabbatical where I traveled through India and Indonesia, where part of my roots are in Indonesia. My father was born there. And the spiral dynamics model did something to me. It resonated and it clicked so many things inside me. And there was one people who noticed that, and that was Don. So. Don invited me to join with a group of people in the Netherlands and that meeting became um, the founding meeting of the Center for Human Emergence in the Netherlands um, together with many other people, Peter Mary and Annemarie Voorhoeven, I became one of the core leaders in that organization um, and um, in time, the Center for Human Emergence got questions from other organizations because we were not only applying spiral dynamics, but also holacracy and other what we call holistic models of ourselves. And then other companies asked us if we could help them as well. So we set up a consulting company owned by the um, Center for Human Emergence, which is a foundation in the Netherlands. And I was one of the two directors of that company. Mm. From Center of Human Emergence, we got an invitation from a community in Zambia to come to see what is happening there and to document what is happening there. And that was my first meeting with Africa. And I think Sub-Sahara Africa, I should say. I think it was around 2009. Mm. I was very inspired and I learned a lot. I was only there for 10 days, but learned a lot. And one of the inspirations was to, organ to develop a program, a uh, leadership development program for Westerners in the theory U setting. And the bottom of the U in my fantasy was going to be a journey to Africa to meet with people who are in a complete different reality uh, and to use that to go up in the U afterwards. Um, I want to be concrete and tangible and most of the bottom of the use in my fantasy are two theories going up. In eleven, I was invited by a community here in Ghana. I'm currently in Ghana. And community leaders representing one tribe, the Dagomba tribe, invited me to, to come to Ghana. Uh, the Dagomba are about 2 million people. It's about 20% of the Ghanaian population. And though 
what we call here Dagumba State is part of the country Ghana. It is also a state within the state. It's completely different from the rest of uh, the country. It has its own rules and the tribal values in spiral dynamics purple is still very, very strong here. Mm. <clears throat> I traveled back and forth. I stayed here invited by local people with local people and to make a longer story short, my position here now is one of an adopted child. That's the easiest way. You can see that I'm white. You know that I'm not born an Agomba man in Ghana, but I'm adopted as one. Well. I am part of the community. I even have official roles within the community. So I'm not a visitor. I'm part of the spiral in um, the Dagumba tribe, which is special to me, but also to them, because that is something that doesn't happen often. Um, together with my brother, I should say, Umar Mohammed, uh, we started supporting a group of women and their communities. Uh, um, and how, what they want, I don't want to take too much of what they want and how they see their own future and how they want to develop their own future. And the women are illiterate. They don't know how to speak English. They don't know how to read and write. And they live a traditional life, which they want to sustain. The tribal leaders and their husbands support them strongly there because the tribal values are very important. I learned a lot about the tribal values. Um, and basically on an abstract level, what we are trying to do is revive uh, tribal values and give the positive elements of the tribal values a future. Uh, on the concrete level, we have chosen to work with the women and with shea butter because that makes everything tangible. So we started. Yeah, can I interfere here? Because you uh, you said you want to preserve the, the the tribal qualities, you know, and that ties perfectly in with the talk I had done with Renee. She said her dream is to keep purple alive wherever she is, and so I think you will have a good way to exchange now. Can we give yeah. to Renee uh, the possibility to, to say where she is, what she is doing? And it, as you know, you can go to the website and see her other talk. It's wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Heidi. And thank you for the opportunity to have a chat with both of you. Um, it really is uh, something that, that I would like to um, do as part of the introduction is to, to really say that my dream came true the day when I met Rika. Um, many, many years ago, we worked together in the finance industry. So we became friends and we've been working together for more than 20 years already. Um, when she started Mandala Consulting, I was privileged enough in the beginning years of Mandala to really become part of the family. And it was really wonderful to be able to live out the dream that I had, which at the time I couldn't voice because I didn't know what it was. But as you develop yourself, you actually realize that the passion that you have for people is all part of, and that's why Spiral resonates with me, is that um, although we all go through and transcend and we covert sometimes in the spiral, there's certain things that really makes us believe in the goodness of people. And purple for me, in a, in, a, in a way, is really represented by that we really care about each other. Um, and when you talk about um, being adopted, then that's the way that I feel too, you know. And, and I remember when I did the learning and development for um, one of the mining companies in Ghana, Tarkwa and Amal, they said that I'm a Bruni, which is a white person, but my heart is the same. And to me, that is what it's all about. You know, it's not about the outside, but what you carry inside your heart. And that is something that will always stick with me. So I can remember starting to learn certain phrases in, in um, tree that really make my life easier because 
I believed what I said, you know. So when I said something like Madame Foupa, which means my best friend, I really meant it from the bottom of my heart. And when I, when I walk past someone and I say, at the same, it's really, how are you? Because they have a fantastic way of really connecting. You don't say to people, people that, that come from that kind of background, how are you, if you don't really want to know. And that to me was something that I've learned quite a bit as I went through a, a time back in corporate and I came back to Mandala. So yes, I am with Mandala Consulting and very privileged to actually extend our footprint into the UK, um, which is something that I'm really looking forward to. And we're going to start maybe a little bit small, but part of the Human Emergent Center um, or Center of Human Emergent. And from there, build it further. Hopefully one day, Elaine, I will have the, the privilege of meeting up with you in Ghana again because my heart is there. You're Good and solid. House. I absolutely love Ghana. I cannot even say it any other way. I love the people and I love the way that they really value each other. For me, that's something that will always stick to me. And that's me in short. I'm a, I'm a consultant and I, I work together with, with Rika and Mandala Consulting. Um, but more on the part of Metamore, where I'm the director, and that is part of the learning and development leg or division of Mandala Consulting, where we have our different courses that's in that part of it, you know, like the, the um, leadership development uh, courses. And yes, very excited, looking forward to a new era up here when I go to the UK one of these days. Wonderful. You're thank very you. welcoming, Anna. So. Ah, thank you. <laughs> yeah, I brought you together just to learn more from you, more about your experiences, and I would invite you just to share freely between you without me interfering, and I'm just listening, okay? <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Heidi. What's interesting for me, Lane, that you were talking about is that you became part of, of the community of a certain part in Ghana. Um, and it's quite a big tribal um, uh, community. If you use, talk about two million people, um, how long did it take you before they made you part of them, before they adopted you, if I can say that? Uh, I think that's a process. Um, maybe it's nice to start with the starting point. In my first meeting, in my first visit here, which is now about eight, nine years ago, uh, I sat with the leaders who invited me. Uh, about 90% of the Dagomba tribe are Muslim people. Um, and I sat with them and I asked them, one of the questions that I had was, um, you know, I'm born as a Jew. Is that a problem? And they looked at me and they said, you are born as a Jew, but then you are genuinely a brother of ours because we <laughs> Jews and Muslims, we have the same father, Abraham. <laughs> so instead of, that already confronted me with my prejudice about uh, based on my experience and what I learned and hear from Islam with the reality here. So that was humbling and it was also opening because that's a good start. How much better can we start? Uh, I do not live permanently. First journey was an invitation and after I went back on my own initiative. We can speak about a lot of things and what Umar and I have chosen to do is to do small things that are tangible and small things that really change something in the community. So for instance, oh, maybe I will take too, too much time, uh, but by creating results, uh, by, I like what you say, you know, here, People are not so much in their minds, but they can feel your heart. And me returning, and me returning, and nobody's paying me for this. Uh, and me spending private money, and now me 
organizing funding to have one of the largest shea butter production centers in Ghana, that creates both relationship uh, and at a certain moment, uh, I was given a, a tribal name. So I have a local name uh, and uh, some other things happened that I want to share with you, but to, since we are recorded, I don't think it's so relevant. But it's a process, and um, people here also introduce me as not as an outsider, but as a leader. Uh, Fantastic. Yeah, it is. It's very special. Yeah, I, I can remember when I when I first got the and and you know doing something like um, learning learning and development or leadership development for them is something that was. Uh, Rika asked me uh, during a conversation once, what do I want to do? And I said to her, it was part of a psychometric that she did on me called um, CPA, Career Pulse Appreciation. And I said to her, I see myself standing on tables teaching people in Africa. And that was only the words. Although I felt it in my heart and I knew that that was what I want to do. I didn't know how it would come about. And it was nearly two years later, and that was exactly what we did, you know. And if I think of the continuation, and that's maybe we I want to to start off my conversation, Heidi, is if, and um, I'm sorry that, that Rika is not able to join us at the moment, and maybe she does join us later. But I can remember that she went and she did consecutive work um, at the two mining houses, you know, or at the, at the mine. And through that, people started to believe in a word because it was measured, remeasured, and, and you could see that level of growth completely. And when I joined, I was almost accepted as part of her without me having to have to become part of because I already believe so much in her. And I think that's what you would also say, you know, if you bring people over, they almost accept it because I accept you. And that to me was wonderful. Um, and not, not only in, in Ghana, I think in Africa itself, even South Africa for that matter, um, coming from South Africa and working in the mining industry, is absolutely amazing when you start to talk to the people and you start to connect with them in a language that is not Afrikaans, English, Sutu, um, Dutch, whatever. It is a, it's a language of the heart where purity is the only qualification. When you start to connect there, people relate to you in a total different way. But the minute that they see there's a slight bit of artificial or unauthentic nature in you, you will never be accepted. And for you to be able to go back and forth, and even myself and Rika, you know, for so many years shows that what we did really made a difference in the life of the people. And we will forever be welcome. And that is what, what for me is one of the most amazing things of, of not only the people of Ghana, but people in Africa in general. If I think of going away and, and leaving the people the year behind that I've worked with for many years, my heart is sore because it will always beat for Africa. And I know that a part of me will always be here. It doesn't matter where I am in the world. I will refer to, to Africa as my country. And that's the bigger Africa. It's no longer just South Africa. And that's something that I think um, is something that you also start to more and more experience. Coming from a first world country, was it a challenge for you at first when you started to work there? Yes, and it still is. You know, relating to what you are saying in general, I see our Western societies in Europe and even more in the United States are so much focused on you as an individual. Mm -hmm. You have to develop yourself. You have to show up yourself in order to be able to. And here it's in the genetic codes uh, that it's much more about we. Uh, yes and you are not relevant, we are important. And I think that's one thing that we here try to cherish and something that we as white Westerners can learn a lot of. And you know, I just 
jumped into deep water, not knowing how to swim without any saving materials. <laughs> so um, yes, it, I, I am also growing into that. And um, the social technology and my experience or skills in spiral dynamics helped me some. Another what helps me a lot is my personal spiritual practice. Uh, mm -hmm. This is not spiral dynamics, this is integral. So I am part of this whole situation. Mm -hmm. And, you know, being here in a primarily purple entering red environment, I want to learn more about your experience in the Ashanti region. And I can also see that Ashanti region is also very different from uh, from Dakko State. Yes. In my fantasy, Ashanti is already much more into blue orange. Uh, and here I'm working with people who are into deep purple, entering red. Uh, and I not only learned a lot about the purple here and also the unhealthy elements of it, um, I also learned a lot about my own purple and unhealthy elements in that. Or how my brain wants to link with purple, but people here do not understand that at all, or are not really interested at all, how that creates pain inside, and all, uh, my, my frustrations, my impatience. So I have learned so much and still am learning so much, not only about here, but also about myself. And, that's you know. I fully agree with you. If I if I think of um, the the blue that we experience, um, I want to say that when when we first saw it, and I I still have a slideshow, Heidi, and I will see if I can't find it somewhere where we took pictures in the villages, and it it was remarkable. That was two thousand or twenty ten when I first went there, and I can remember that a lot of um, look, Ashanti region, in my opinion, I haven't been there for the last three years, so I can't vouch for it. I don't know how drastic the changes are, but it comes from a religious uh, side of Christianity. And um, what, what was amazing for me was that when we first got there, a lot of the, the shops even had a connection to the Christian belief. So it would be something like, um, praise God enterprises and whether that was uh, coming from Islam or whether it came from Christianity doesn't matter and there was one that was something like um, uh, I just need to think of the specific name but his mercy his salon and I thought to myself wow that is incredible because that is really connecting not only the personal belief but taking it further and making it part of a business decision. So even a business decision for me was based on the value. And the value was, in this case, a Christian belief. You know, it almost advocate what they believe in before they even say it. You don't need to wonder, where does this person come from? Where's the family roots and all of that? Because it says it. It will say the Holy Gospel um, uh, food store. It was beautiful. And as we progressed, and over the time, until 20, uh, late 2013, you could see how Western influences started to change that, that the names even started to change. And for me, that was when I started to feel, Heidi, that I would love to preserve the purple that we have there. Otherwise, it will be forever gone. And nobody will understand how beautiful, pure it can be. In, and I'm sure in your region where you work predominantly, it's also that same kind of connotation um, to either their belief or whatever the case may be. But it was fas fascinating for me that doesn't matter where you went, the blue sort of, I don't want to say the word challenge, but almost, yeah, maybe it's a good word, but challenge the purple to say, you know, you must be more, a rule following, you can't be late for meetings, you must do things like this, you must do things like that. And almost the word must that was in there came from a blue background, rule following. 
And for them, it must have been shell-shocked to say, but you know what, we in any case meet, whether we meet at six o'clock or at 10 o'clock, we still meet. Rika, the first time when she went to Ghana, she had the driver take her to, from Accra to Tarpa. And she, she said to him, she said, Mr. Asani, how long will it take us to be there? And he said, we'll be there, there just now, or now now. It was five and a half hours drive later. Ghana time. Ghana time. It's irrelevant. You're still going to get there. But that's when I realized that a lot of times we, we tend to see that people coming from a purple background would like to say what they think you want to hear and not say what it is. Yeah, and to add on what you were sharing, there's another thing that I think is really important to distinguish the traditional Dagomba tribe from the traditional Ashanti tribe is many Ashanti are middle-class people. The Ashanti are the traders, the Dagomba are the farmers uh, ah. and, the, and the warriors. So the Ashanti kingdom, is built on mercenary warriors from the Dagomba tribe. Uh, wow. So there you see that blue orange is much more integrated uh, also in the activities. And of course you have entrepreneurial people from the Dagomba tribe. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, and, but you know, Africa is the largest continent in the world. Afri Ghana is large and I'm here in Dagbal State. So I speak and I work with a community of people who are living in a reality that is predominantly purple, entering red with uh, even beige, because people here are also concerned, the primary concern is food on the table for my family this evening. Uh, yes, one not, out not of even week's time even. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, one out of two children die before the age of one. So that statistic is higher than in Ghana, in Ghana in general. So this is the reality where I live in here. And at the sure. same time, we have built the shape of the processing center, yeah. which yeah. is a huge investment, uh, which only can be successful if we run it in a blue orange way. Uh, so there are many challenges yeah. which I am still learning and also hope to learn from you and from, from Rika, from your experience. Yeah, and, and one of the things that I would like to share with you is maybe going back to, to the BQ, because that makes it easy for me to, to bring the colors into it or bring a spiral into it that we can understand. And that was when we did the, the BQ, which is the instrument that Rika developed as part of a PhD. It's called Benchmark of Engagement Cushion. And that measures the culture of the organization based on their values. So it also brings spiral in, in, in quite a big way. But the very first time that I did it, she did it prior to that already at the mines. But when I joined, it was 2010. And the very first time that I did it, it was quite challenging because yeah, I come from South Africa. And you know, we are more developed than the rest of Africa. In terms of infrastructure, I come from an Afrikaans background, that makes it even more difficult. But the one thing that was definitely um, a, a, a plus point for me was the fact that my father has always been on the mine. So he worked on the mines for 48 years. And although it's a different country, the culture somehow gelled because it was a South African corporate company going into Ghana, creating this blue environment that people had to work in and creating a safe space for people to be able to be purple if they if that is where they were and that's exactly what we found but when we went back and i went back to give feedback it was fantastic for me to have that opportunity to actually say to them this is what we found so we can see that there are certain things that are challenging for you but can you share with me what are some of the things that you would like me if I'm your mouthpiece to your managers to say to them, and this is where I want to talk a little bit about purple before I go to blue and before I go to orange. And I will never forget um, the one guy said to me, and it was a big group of safety officers. And he said, you know what? 
we would like you to ask management that we would like to have long sleeve shirts. And I said, why? He says, because of the malaria, we don't want to have to take off work. We like to work. And we have to take off because of them stinging us. And it was so totally different than the red that we've experienced in, in South Africa, some of the, the corporations that we work, where people would say, give me more money is the first thing that they say. And in an aggressive way. Yeah, people say, we, we don't worry about that. We, we are so grateful to have a job, but please make, make the sleeves longer. And from the previous time that Rico were there, they asked that they can be, if there can be air conditioners put into the buses because they don't want to start working if they're dirty. And when they go home in the afternoon, they want to be proud of themselves and also be clean. But because of the red ground, and you will know, and Heidi, the roads, they have this, this sticky red sand. It's really hard. And it would blow into the buses because there's no air cons and it's so very hot. I mean, between 43, I would say, is the average. Um, 37 to 43 degrees, depending on what time of the year it is. And people say that they would get very dirty and it, it bothered them. How beautiful is that? Then they said, you know what we want more than anything is a road from Tarpa to the Mang to be a proper road because our people work on both mines. But it means that they have to go out in the morning at four o'clock to wait for the bus, where it should take them. It's 33 kilometers but it takes an hour and 15 minutes to drive that road because the, the road is so bad. If they can do that for us, we can give better work production because we don't, we're not, we're not tired by the time that we get to work because you stand on the road at four o'clock, you get to work at six o'clock, you go off from work eight hours later and then you have to wait two hours to be able to go to, uh, back to your home. That's the reality. Tomorrow morning, they do exactly the same. And for me, that was one of the things that were absolute eye opener. As we went further into the organization, what became paramount for me was how people started to think in a blue way when it came to managerial skills. And they said, you know, and one of the things that I did at the time of the leadership development program is I would take a plain business scenario and say, you the new manager of the mine, how do you turn this mine around? This is how much ounces you need to produce by that. And you know, we started at, at um, a quite a low level to a, a quite, quite a senior level and everyone worked together and they built those business cases. And I remember one of the people said to me, they don't want to go home that day. And I said, but you must go home, your families are waiting. I said, but you know, we can really make a difference if they can work on this today. How beautiful is that? It's a business case in a pool, but they made it so personal. And that's when I realized that there's a lot of blue and a lot of entrepreneurial things coming out. So the orange definitely came from that. The more that I understood the business acumen, the more they were accepted into what is your role in the strategy of, of the organization, the more they started to think in an absolute beautiful blue and orange way. And after a long period of time, it was almost a year, they would do a um, presentation back to me and to management on their role as a, as a first line supervisor or a first line manager. What is, uh, how would they change the strategies to, be, to make their team part of this, the biggest strategy of the organization? You know what, they built that with so much pride. No way would a person just be purple if they can do it like that? And that's where you really saw them come out with this strong, really belief in how to apply business um, in, in a blue way and in an orange way. And that is one of the things that you can definitely see in the Asante region, especially with the mindset, because people are very highly qualified. Hey? And there's great emphasis on education in Ghana in general. Um, I remember at the time when I went, 96% um, of, of the mining population had at least a qualification um, of O-level or above, or a grade 12 in South Africa. 
So they already studied the full school career and they went on to a tertiary education. So the people definitely are there from their family background, from the community and all of that. But they definitely embraced the we in blue to say we can make it a better future for all of us. And one question. Mm. What do you do or what did you do for blue to include healthy purple and healthy red, uh, where the tendency I see is transcend and replace instead of transcend and include. Yes. What, what did you do or what do you do? It, it was actually very easy for me to do that at first when I realized what is the connection here and what, what is most important to purple is to make it in a value that is of value to them. So you can go into an organization like that and you can do a business scenario and say, you are the mining manager. How do you get production up? How do you get the ounces that you need? How do you do the gold production that you need? What will happen? They will use statistics to prove this is the way that they will do it. But the minute that you say, how can you make sure that your family members that's coming behind you will be part of this mine? And they will be able to work here. And how do you make your father and your grandfather proud because you are part of the mine? That included them all. It was, uh, and there it came into a, a strong purple and a high red because people were sacrificial almost. They said, you know what? We give our lives because we want to provide for our families. Not lives as physical, but, but in that context. And that is how I included them. And when they did the summative assessment, it was quite a big part of that, where they said, how would they make their family proud? What would they do to make sure that the, the life of mine is extended? And what is their role that they would play in that strategy? And um, I have two questions. The first one, to say it bluntly, people are full of shit. They say one thing and they work another. And to say it more in a polite way, there is a difference between the theory espoused and the theory in use. Uh, so uh, it happens a lot here uh, that people say one thing, but are not acting accordingly. Uh, yeah. How do you, I am very impatient about that. My red uh, uh, fires up in an unhealthy way. <laughs> My blue wants to organize it, and my green gets um, hurt. Uh, yeah. yeah. How do you deal? Yeah. How, 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 you recognize that. I, how, do, how do you work with that? Maybe if I can um, uh, say it by example, and that's something that I've noticed, is the minute that you instill pride into people, they want to please. So the minute that you say to them, this is no longer um, the management and the workers and, you know, this is us. So how do we make it better? People want to do that. And the amazing thing is, Elaine, and I must say, in all the time that I was there, I've never had people that really wanted to go another way. They wanted to be part of that success. They wanted to be able to do it. And not one of the people throughout the time that I did that leadership development didn't qualify in the end. So they all did the work that they were supposed to. But I think the, the very main thing that you need to do is they must feel that co-ownership. It's as much me as it is you and we are together in this. Then they start to, to really live it. Um, when, when we did the EQ or the um, emotional intelligence with a group of people that we did the leadership development on, and Rika has wrote this in one of her textbooks, um, the case study of that. I remember that I started with the leadership development, but we do a scientific analysis beforehand. So we do a emotional intelligence benchmark to say where are they at the moment. And then a sustainability of about eight months later, remeasure to see if there's growth and what is the sustainability. And somewhere in between, I can remember that I was called back to South Africa and they said, um, management says that you are too white. You're a woman, you work in a mining environment in a different country and, and predominantly with men. It can't work. 
And Rika took the, the analysis from the EQ before and after, and they were stunned by the fact that the average points that we move them on the Baron, and remember Baron says that if you move people after intervention five points, they are 78% more productive. Uh, the average that that we did at the time, or that I did when I did the leadership development, was an average of 18 points. That's co ownership. So if you can move people like that, they want to be part of it. I can't say that it's something specific, any other than it's the language that you speak that are not a language. It's how you connect, and you will know that, and how you make people proud to be part of it. And um, yeah, definitely that was a big part of our success that we had with that. Needless to say, I was called back to Ghana for another three and a half years, which is fantastic. And I'm very grateful for that. But, but that's what I want to say. So it's really um, instilling that I really want to do this. I really want to be part of it and I'm proud to be part of it. And when you have that, then people are eager to get their business acumen. But do I understand this correctly? Is this really what it is? How do I relate to this? How do I make it part of my team? And yes, of course, there was a lot of challenging things that we had. I remember the one time, and I'm sorry if I talk too much. Can I carry on a little bit longer? <laughs> the, the one time, there was the two teams. It was the drill and blast and the load and haul teams that had a problem with each other. And the, the mining manager at the time, asked if we, if we can intervene. So I did what we call value engineering or value circles based on the theory of Lorraine Loebscher or the, that she taught me. And, you know, we assume a lot of things when we walk into an organization, especially as consultants. And I don't want to say that we're biased, but we just think that we can see things. But we're sometimes we're right, aren't we? <laughs> I'm joking. <laughs> I know, I know. So, yeah, I am sitting with uh, drill and blast, and I'm sitting with load and all. So the two teams didn't see eye to eye. So what would happen is uh, typically the the blur and blast is what they call it, or the blasting team would come in. They would put the dynamite in and the explosion, and the load and haul team will come with the big excavators and take it out of the pit because it's open cast mining. And then I first had them separate and I said, what prevent you from doing it the way that you're supposed to in drill and blast? One of the things that came out and remember that the perception, if I can call it a perception or the assumption that management had is that people abuse the, the machines. What was one of the big things that came out is that the drilling bit that I used to use were replaced by procurement because it was a, a cheaper drill, but now they can't make target with it because it breaks. Isn't that fascinating? You know, so the perception here from management is you misusing it. People feel you're not trusting us and there's an absolute collision in the middle. Then I asked them, so why don't you get the rock out by load and wall in time? They said, no because sometimes the other teams on the mine would take the dozer, then they don't have a, a machine to come in to clean it. And one of their targets is to make sure that the, the big tires on those big trucks, dump trucks, last longer. And if they send it into the pit and it's not smooth, then the tire usage is high. So again, you know, what is the perception and, and what is the real thing? And then you get them to go back to management and explain to them what is perceived and what is the actual thing. And when you get that disconnect sorted out and you can see how people get together, it is absolutely wonderful. Uh, management is almost dumbstruck because I can't believe that it's something as simple as that there's not enough cones to barricade the area where the blast will take place and that people don't want to work unsafe and therefore they don't get their target. People, on the other hand, can't understand that nobody is really telling management about their difficulties. So there's a disconnect. And when we had that sorted, it became such a good team. And they actually did do very well um, for many years after that. So sometimes you just have to sort of listen. 
and pay attention to what's really said, not what you think what is said. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and, and <laughs> that's what we try to teach in the Western world, uh, or what I used to do in the Western world with managers and business leaders of uh, companies primarily in the Netherlands and governments. Uh, what I learned here is even with the people who are not, there's lack of blue here, there's lack of Arab orange here in the communities that I work in. Yeah. Um, but because of the purple and the reorientation, they have much more talent to adapt. Uh, with what I see is in my previous Western context, it's much more in terms of spiral about creating healthy red, creating healthy purple, creating healthy blue, instead of focusing on orange and more performance indicators or investing in green or helping an organization to go to second tier, which orange yeah. actually loves. And I hate those terms and ambitions. And, and, and here it's, yeah, people have no idea what you're talking about. Uh, but they feel uh, what is right or what is wrong. Or, uh, and it's also interesting listening to you. And I don't want to pull away or anything. Mm -hmm. uh, but honestly, it's so different. Uh, you know, the community and the people that we work with, and we do cherry picking. Uh, so we work with people who we trust. We give leadership positions to people who the community trusts. Uh, yeah. um, with the chiefs, 95 out of 100 are not decent chiefs in the genuine way of the tradition. And there are many good reasons why, and many stories, etc. We try to work with the 5% that are. Um, that's the advantage that I have also being with a brother, a business partner, who yeah. has a strong position as an honorable community leader. Uh, and I strongly build on that. Uh, so, for instance, uh, two examples. One is we have a center now. The center has machines. The women used to produce shea butter from home. They could sure. decide any time what they wanted to work and when. The only agreement was your shea butter has to be ready at that day and they know the quality. But that was the only agreement. But now the machines, we can't run them 24 seven. So the machines need at least one day rest. We have yes. organized the women in groups, which wow. we do not call teams. Now let's stick with the machines. I'm, I'm sharing an example. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, we, the women used to be making shea butter from home. You make your shea butter at your place, you make your shea butter at your place, I do it at my place. Mm -hmm. And the agreement was that that day it has to be at the central spot where we connect. Yes. One of the things that the community, women, and the leaders said, we want to return to our traditional way of making shea butter like our grandparents did. Sure. So we took that serious and we organized the women in groups of 20. Uh, and we do not call them teens. Everybody here is family. We are all family. Yeah. And yeah. those are related uh, in a family bond for real as well. So yeah. what I do is I say, OK, what we do is to say in the center, we are a family who has a task and who has an asset. So we are a professional family. And that's how I try to bring in blue in a way that purple can understand. Uh, if I would call them a team, it doesn't say anything. But if I call it a professional family, then it remains, but still. Fantastic. Um, of course, one professional family can work uh, to do the milling in the machines on day one, but they have to be finished on day one because the next professional family, too, needs to do work on the machines on day two. 
And the same goes with the ovens. Uh, so some assets that we have in the center need to be well planned. And of course that goes wrong. <laughs> in the first yeah. week, it went completely yes. wrong. Uh, because there's so much lack of structure. Uh, mm. And then again, it's how do I deal with that? How do we deal with that as a leader in a way that doesn't overrule the community sense? And at the same time, helps them to improve in a way, meet them where they are, in the steps that they can take. So that's one example. Yeah. The other is for mature purple, and especially right now that we are also, there was nothing when we started. Eh? We had people who didn't have anything. Uh, uh, we started with having creating contracts for them so that they had at least some money earning in some time. And now they have the center, which is theirs, and they need to take full responsibility for it. What yeah. you see, what I see is a lot of flux of unhealthy red coming up. Uh, and the natural growth is, I don't want to pull them in, in, in from purple into red, but it's emerging. Uh, and it's, uh, my understanding of spiral dynamics, it's good that it's emerging. The key question is how do I facilitate healthy expressions or that it emerges in a healthy way? And I see a lot of unhealthy elements happening. So I see at one time somebody, instead of spending the money on the family, spending the money on fancy clothes. Uh, or some people see uh, finding themselves more important than what we are together. Uh, yeah. And I have no answer and I experiment. But basically, you know, I have a history and background in action learning. This is all one big action learning laboratory, actually. Because yeah. if it's not there, it's not real. We can yeah. speak and make a planning about the machines. It becomes real when it goes wrong. Uh, yeah. And the disadvantage of the advantage of red is that we can act quickly. It's resourceful. If something is happening now, we resolve it now. Yes. And at the same time, for the center to make it sustainable and not collapse in two or three years, we need to go beyond that. So there's continuously yes. tension there, uh, where I cannot pull them out of the head, out with, from the hairs up. Um, and I also not always should contain my ideas. Uh, yes. So that's continuously my search. How do I or how do we? And Umar and I, we have meetings with the two of us where nobody else is there because we have built a relationship of trust where we can say anything, which is yes. also not common. Yeah? What you addressed before, people often want to say the things that they think, think you want, want to hear. hear. That's yeah. not what you said. It's so recognizable. We are beyond that stage. And that's something that I'm so proud and grateful of. Because Uber and I, we actually apply dual leadership. No decision is made by him without me. No decision is made by me without him. And because the relationship that really is the X here, because the relationship that we have we speak freely only when other people are not there, because otherwise we might lose space because of our position, and etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, but what comes out of that is always better. Yes. It always uh, is better. Um, I, when when we did, I don't know if you and Trika have had a conversation about the industrial theatre that we did, yes. the cantata in Ghana. But that, that's maybe a topic for another time. Heidi and I would love Rika to also be part of that because it now that was something that worked so well because how do people really learn coming from a purple understanding is through metaphors and stories and you know that and and especially storytelling so uh, we developed or Rika developed in with a whole big team this um, industrial theater that was a show that we did and we had all the people there. So on the first evening, we even had the Queen Mother there. 
And with the industrial theater, the way that we used to it, by the end of it, the um, audience became less, but not there. It actually became more and more. So in the end, our last show were the biggest attendance. That was after five weeks. But everyone went to it. And then we had big group facilitation conversations with them. And we had safety skits in between. It was really a phenomenal way of getting the message across on how to embed values of the organization into the heart of the people. And that's something that, that's very, very powerful is through that storytelling that we found that touch people in a way that you cannot imagine. And everyone wanted to be part of that. So there was a qualifying question. Do you really want to live these values? If you don't want to, you don't need to. You don't need to accept this band. But everyone wanted so badly to be part of it. And you cannot believe the impact that it had on that mining environment where we were and on their safety. Um, and that was really through showing what does one person that gets hurt, what is the ripple effect on the rest of the community if that happens. Um, and in your case, you know, if you take if you take the people that maybe use the money for different reasons than what they should, it's almost to show to them how short-sighted it will be because green is all about preserving it for future generations. And we have to get people to understand that green is as important as any other color. Yeah, the money is maybe not a good, good, good example, but yes. I can want to share another one because yeah. it's deductible to individual people. Uh, of course. And basically, you know, what people do with their money is their decision. Uh, yes. I, I do not control their money. We pay the women a decent price. We give them money up front. Uh, and what they do with it is their concern. It's much okay. more about, and that's really interesting, in the past, the women received both an individual bonus and a group bonus. And the individual bonus was, before the center was there, was given out to every woman individually. The group bonus was shared among the women. So everybody got her share, which I fully understand because they don't have enough money in their hand. And the key issue is to have enough money in your hand to put your family today. Yeah. So, I understand that, and it's their decision. What I did do is ask them, it's a group bonus, and if you want to make progress as a group, wouldn't be, it, it'd be interesting to discuss as a group whether you want to change that or not, and I don't have any authority about it, uh, and if you say, no, we don't want to do that, you should not do it. Uh, mm. Uh, but I hear, and I hear you say you want this, then how are we going to act accordingly? And it was a process of two years where sure. the conversation Fantastic. went. And it's easy to say we do this as a group, we give the bonus to the group as a whole and we invest it for the group as a whole at the moment that the money is there, not there, but on the moment that the money comes, that's the moment when the actual decision is being made. And it yeah. took two years yeah. for the yeah. group to decide that they want to use the group bonus for the group as a whole. For the group. And <laughs> now that we have the center, nobody doubts that the group bonus doesn't go to anything else than things that are needed for the center, repairing, mm -hmm. painting, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, and even further, the women themselves took the step to give up their individual bonus to do their contribution to the center as a whole. And that's, Isn't that fantastic? It makes me even now emotional. Of you know, course. They come and they say, we don't have much. We know it's not enough, but this is what we can do. And I yeah. know that it's a suffering for them. Uh, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Wow. How fantastic. I would love to meet up with those women and meet them one day. I will definitely see if I can't make a plan um, sometime soon, because I think that the work that you do there is really, 
Uh, Bond breaking. What do you mean? Now, yeah. uh, you know, it, it's really something so unique, but it's really setting the tone for so many other women and so many other organizations to, to do that. So how wonderful is it to almost be the trendsetter? That's the kind of thing that I want to yes. say. It's almost said, be the first in that kind of thing. And that kind of thing, thinking must be fantastic to see how they develop into what they can see as not only the year and the now, but tomorrow and next year and five years from now. And to be able to get to that stage, well, I commend you for all that work. Thank you. Well, what I, what I said before is you are very, very welcome. Uh, and at the same time, you know, I guard this community as a mother lioness who protects her children. So there are many, many people who want to come. Uh, I don't say this to everybody. Uh, what I would like is if it happens, that we find a way how it can become beneficial for the community. And I trust that, that we can do that. Otherwise, I would not say you are very, very welcome. Uh, Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Heidi? Uh, yeah, that was wonderful conversation. And what I got out of this is a ulterior confirmation. It's not about the things itself, but it's about how you communicate, how we learn from our Westerner mindset to come down and, and how do you say, to, to, to understand how the other mindsets are and find the right language with which we can reach them. And that's not an easy talk for people in orange, uh, blue, orange, green, even green, you know? So that's pioneer work, what you are doing. You should do courses for how to <laughs> learn to, 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 it's not only the spoken language, but also the, the body language and the, the, the strategies, you know, how to, to do that as a Westerner. And that should be, would be good also for us if yeah. we could relearn uh, this way of being in the world, you know, so. That's I would like to, if I'm allowed, I would like to add one thing. Uh, it has to come both ways. Yeah. Uh, so if we are doing all the learning and the changing, it doesn't benefit the local community. And we treat it doesn't serve the communities here. So it has to come from both ways. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, you know, it's so interesting. Um, I see people here. They tell me, you know, we are learning so much, uh, and we are doing things that we never thought we were able to do. And we are doing things that we would not dare doing without you. And then I think, yeah, but me too. Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. And the concrete that I wanted to say, and at the same time, there's still this tension and dynamics. So talking about orange blue, introducing orange blue in a purple red environment, I asked the community, how are we going to organize the center in a way that it's successful in an international business setting where people think differently than we do. And then the first reaction is, Alain, we trust you, we know you, you make a plan and we will do what you have planned for us. And my first reaction is, no way. No way. No way that no way. that's going to happen. No. I can make a plan, but we are going to discuss it. What comes out of that is always better than my plan. And that is what we are going to do if we decide upon that this is the right thing to do. But there's continuously this push, um, and also internally, uh, I have a context and a focus, only on uh, being able to speak English and uh, have this conversation with you, connect deeply with the outer world, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So it's continuously, attention that needs attention and for me that's where my personal practice and with me that's meditation serves my purpose uh, to say a small word serves in what i'm doing here and that's also that i build upon with the people here i use the purple uh, uh, and the red blue of religion but there is hardly any blue here 
Hmm. So in a way, I use God to keep people together for Allah. Uh, uh, hmm. And you know, we even build a mosque in the Shemata Center. It probably is the only Shemata processing center in whole Ghana that has a space for spiritual practice. Um, wow. Um, yeah, well, and it's it's important to honor what the people believe in, you know, and it's important to to allow them to grow in that too. Because uh, the, for me, the higher purple is is the spirituality that comes with it. That's much bigger than just my belief. It is it is so much bigger than that. <coughs> it is, we can make space for each other in our belief systems. We can make space for each other in our spirituality. Doesn't matter where we come from, but how can we make this the best world that we can by doing it together? Well, basically, Which, what, what, basically what we do is we push people in a position that they have to put their actions where their mouth is. Uh, yeah. So you say you are a Muslim, you say that prayer is important, there is the mosque, so you pray. And we make it part of our process. Uh, Fantastic. And you know, there's so many people who call them Christian, and I have many examples in the Shanti region as well. There's mm. so many people who call them a Muslim. Uh, and uh, then I think, well, by name, but not by action. Uh, mm. And I'm harsh. And I have the authority to, I can say to other people, you call yourself a Muslim, but where is your behavior accordingly? Yes, precisely. Exactly like that. But you can't do it. Another white person cannot do that. I can only do that. And I'm, everybody knows that I'm not a Muslim. <laughs> uh, I can only do that because of the, being an adopted child in purple. Yeah, yeah. And having the position of authority in red. Uh, yeah, yeah. And connecting with matters. Yeah. Well, yeah, thank you very much. And I'm glad I have made the connection between you and then hopefully also with Rika in, in the future. And uh, let's the conversation get on soon again about this. It's just, I have many questions still, but another time. Because I'm an outsider. I, I <laughs> still have to understand a little bit. <laughs> okay, That's wonderful. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you, Lane. Keep well. Thank and, you. Yeah. and I hope Bye -bye. that you are absolutely blessed on that side. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.